podcasts are one of the best ways to build trust with potential customers and to create a base of content that can be used for marketing and sales. Much of the podcast industry, however, is focused on B2C or entertainment or all of those other areas. So Build That Podcast is bringing you the B2B PodCon. It's a conference specifically designed for you in the B2B space. Join hundreds of B2B podcast professionals this November in Nashville, Tennessee, and learn from industry leaders, experienced podcasters, and content strategists. Walk away motivated with actionable steps that you can implement immediately. So tickets go on sale July 24th at the best price you will find. So go to b2bpodcon.com to learn more. Make sure to sign up for the email list. We're going to send out updates on speakers as well as ticket information as it becomes available, all of it through the email. Don't miss the premier event for B2B podcast professionals. Go to b2bpodcon.com to learn more. There are some wins that come immediately, and that's being really strategic with the people that you're interviewing and building referral partners with them. So they're connecting you to your dream clients. Do that right away. Anything where you can do partnerships, collaborations, borrow other people's audiences, you will get wins right away on that. For your owned media, it does take a little extra time to build that momentum for it. But if you do it in the way I'm describing today, where it culminates into that event where people are going and they're gaining real actionable value, then you can start getting clients from it within the first couple of months. Welcome to It's Marketing's Fault, the podcast where we discuss how to do marketing the right way. I'm your host, Eric Rutherford, and I am thrilled today because I have with me Sarah Noel Block. She is the founder of Tiny Marketing, which seeks to help B2B service providers that, that just have founder-led marketing and who just need a more streamlined marketing engine that makes sales easier. Sarah, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Uh, it is it is my pleasure, and I, I love the the name tiny marketing. Like I, I just appreciate that. And just as I read through some of your content and putting kind of the script together, I would love to hear how did you come up with this idea for tiny marketing? Yeah, I was always part of a small marketing department. So I didn't always have my own business. There's so many people I know that was like right out of school. They're like, yep, I'm doing the thing. That was not me. I was a big chicken. And I worked in corporate marketing for 15 years. And it tiny marketing started because I was a one person marketing department for a seven company group. <laughs> yes, you can just pop your job back closed. It was hard. I had to answer to seven presidents. We had different business plans for each business. And I needed to figure out how to make that work because I felt like I was set up for failure. Until one day I, I hit a wall and I was like, I can't, I can't keep doing it the way I'm doing it. So I came up with a framework that I use now for my clients and it just made everything easier, <laughs> so much easier. Wow. That's, that sounds awful. Like just that whole experience sounds awful of trying to, to run seven different marketing groups by yourself and somehow keep everybody happy, which my guess is you weren't able to make everybody happy. I mean, it's possibly you were. originated there. <laughs> <laughs> so you came up with a framework that really kind of solves your problems. Then would you, what kind of framework is it? Would you be willing to elaborate or is yeah, that like the secret sauce that we no. can't go in and discuss the ingredients? I am the anti-gatekeeper. Ask anybody. <laughs> I am telling you everything that works. <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> uh, so streamline. So that's where I have like a simple five-point marketing plan for them where you identify the one channel you're going to be on, the one core content you're going to have, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so streamline first, systematize. 
So what can we create templates around to make it easier? Can we have an SOP for this that we can replicate pretty easily? Can we add automations in there? And then um, that leads into the sec- the next part, which is automations and AI. Where can we connect our technology to save us time and money? So anywhere we can have automations in, if we could train chat GPT on something to add as our assistant, our first draft person <laughs> is a robot. Um, so that's next. And then <clears throat> outsource. So any of the things that you can't do in those first pieces, what can you outsource? What do you absolutely hate doing? Dread, it takes you forever, but someone else loves it and it would take them less time. And that's where that comes in. All right, folks, a quick breather here. You know, in my time building my business, I've come to a profound realization. Certain tools can be a game changer. That's why I'm excited to talk about Lead Feeder. It's a tool that helps you cut through the data and turn those website visitors into solid leads. Lead Feeder shows you which companies are checking out your site, tracking their behavior, and integrates all this with your CRM. Result? your secret weapon for targeted lead engagement and making it easier for your team to convert website traffic into sales. Head to leadfeeder.com for a free demo and get a free extended premium trial when you let the rep know that you found about Lead Feeder through the It's Marketing's Fault podcast. All right, back to the show. I love that. I love the, the systematic approach of of walking through those just removing all the work that you either don't like don't do well you're just trying to make it easy on them it sounds like just and and on you yeah. as well i mean now i am training founders on how to do this for themselves because they are overwhelmed they don't know what to do and this makes it doable you're consistent you're constantly showing up for your audience And you're building trust with them. And that's why it's so much easier to sell. You don't even have to sell. You get on that sales call and they're like, can you send the contract? Because you've sold them through your content. Wow. I'm sure too, like, I know founders are swamped. Like they're they're having to do every job. 17 hats. (laughs) It it is. And and they're, you know, and even even once they get the, the business up to, a few people, 10 people, like they're, they're still, they have their hands in everything just because either they can't bring in enough people or they can't, they don't want to let it go. Like it could be, I'm sure a, a mix of things that, yeah. that you're just taking off their plate. All of those things. And marketing is, in my experience, has always been the last hire. I have worked for companies that are making hundreds of millions of dollars that don't have a marketing department. I am their marketing department. It's always the last hire when people are bringing in someone. And But with when you're working with me, that's okay. You can have a VA or an assistant or an admin take the grunt work in marketing that you don't want to do as long as you have a strategic guide to get you through it so you know what you're doing and that it makes sense. So it sounds like then you're you're just the the repeatable process is what you're setting them up for, and the idea is not to reinvent the wheel, but just to be able to do quick and easy is the wrong phrase, but the but but just this idea of you just have to keep doing the steps to get your content out there, and over time it will it'll do magic. Yeah, it's definitely not quick and easy, but I can walk you through my content marketing strategy that yeah, that would be that'd be awesome. It's really systematized, but it really works too in bringing in referral partners, bringing in new clients. So, that core content that I mentioned earlier, that would be like a podcast like your show or a live stream show or even a webinar series can be core content. And what you would want is to do like this. You could have an interview style on some episodes. You don't have to do all of them that way. But those interviews can turn into referral partners. So make sure that you're picking really strategic people that can add value to your audience, but also serve the same audience as you and do something different than you. 
so they can be turned into referral partners. So that's like the easy wins quick that happens right away. And then um, as you're going, I build them out into series of three to five episodes per topic. And then it culminates into a virtual event. So it could be a panel, a webinar, something like that. That's based off of that original series. And maybe I'm bringing in those people and having them on a panel that were my interviews. But all of the listeners that were involved in that series, they want to attend that event and get that extra piece. So now I've converted them to my email list and I can continue bringing that relationship a little bit closer so it's easier to sell. We just got a little bit more intimate because now you've had this conversation with me. You've seen my face during a virtual event and then maybe we might do a one-to-one connection call. But the idea is with every step to get a little bit closer to your audience and build a little more intimacy in in that relationship. Wow. That's, I mean, that's brilliant just in terms of it. it's small steps moving toward, it's not like a big leap. It's not like trying to convince somebody of anything. You're really I like the trust building that that you're talking about, whether that's through a podcast, whether whether that's through, you know, through other content. How do you I know you mentioned like one like content platform, like pick one. Mm -hmm. Uh, How do you how do they figure that out? Is it what they're. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's what I was curious. Is it is it something they're most comfortable with? Because I'm that I is that a a hard thing to convince them of? Because uh, I see the value in it. I'd love for you to elaborate. Yeah, it basically comes down to a Venn diagram. What do you have time to do? What does your customer like to listen to? How do they like to consume content? So I have conversations with their customers. I am on one-to-one calls with them, chatting with them, (laughs) and figuring out what kind of content they like. And that happens before you launch that stage that you're going to be owning. And then you need to take into consideration how much time do you actually have to, to do this? And what do you feel comfortable with? Maybe you hate being on video. So it could be like an audio event on LinkedIn. It could be something else altogether. I like that idea, the Venn diagram. I didn't realize that you're actually on the phone listening and talking to the customers. Well, that has to be just a wealth of knowledge because I know in marketing, we often don't get to talk to the customer. We want to, but we don't often get that opportunity. Um, What kind of... What kind of things do you learn in that capacity, even beyond content, like even beyond the content type? Does it help you just even with positioning or helping to kind of guide the founder through what 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 do you hear? I love having these conversations and I do it with pretty much all of my clients. I talk to their customers and um, so I have this thing that I call the strategic story where it's an all-in-one messaging, marketing, and content strategy. So these interviews happen before then, and it's guiding what that messaging looks like, the positioning, where how they make buying decisions. So we can look at everything, like what kind of content would drive them? What objections do they have when they're making these buying decisions that we can overcome way before that sales call? And um, it's not something to skip. <laughs> Have those conversations with customers. <laughs> so uh, I think this this is brilliant and so so helpful as you're you're creating this narrative because you you now understand the customer. How like are these? So these conversations are these with existing customers for the business? Is it with potential customers? Um, how's that work? Yeah, it's with their favorite customers. So the ones we're trying to clone, that's who I'm having the conversations with. Occasionally I work with a founder who hasn't yet worked with the, their dream client. And that's when it gets a little, 
a little harder, a little scrappier because we have to go out and seek out those, that group of people. And I usually can't get them on a call if (laughs) they have no relationship with the, the client. But what I do instead is I hang out in their watering holes. What communities are they in? I'll pull them in those communities and start conversations in the DMs. And that's how I'm gathering it when you don't have any contact with your Drew, what, at least what you expect to be your dream client. I like that. So it sounds like then the the companies you're working with, they've got just enough frequently. They have just enough um, sort of runway. So they've got at least a few customers and, and they're really trying to, honestly, they're just trying to, to scale and build and, and get, get out of their own way. It sounds yeah. like these aren't new companies. They were probably founder led from the beginning. Maybe they have a biz dev person or they hired a salesperson. Definitely not marketing yet. Um, so they have an established business, but it's been a lot of work. Like it has been scrappy and manual to get people on the phone to sell to. And it's really hard to actually sell and get them to say, yeah, you're the solution that I want to go with because they have none of those trust building elements. They don't have an established relationship ahead of time. So this process makes all of that end so much easier. Now, and I know earlier, you you know, you had said it just part of it is it takes time to to get this content, the sources out there to show that early trustworthiness so that they they take that, you know, the customer will follow that path and that journey uh, to become a customer. How how long does it take to really see the benefit of the system and the content that you're creating uh, because it's not overnight. And, but is that like, is that like 12 months? Is that like six months? Is that like more or less? I'd love to, to hear what your experience has been. There are some wins that come immediately and that's being really strategic with the people that you're interviewing and building referral partners with them. So they're connecting you to your dream clients. Do that right away. Anything where you can do partnerships, collaborations, borrow other people's audiences, you will get wins right away on that. For your owned media, it does take a little extra time to build that momentum for it. But if you do it in the way I'm describing today, where it culminates into that event where people are going and they're gaining real actionable value, then you can start getting clients from it within the first couple of months. Wow. Let's kind of dive in a little bit on the events because you mentioned it earlier, this idea of, of, of being strategic, not only in your partners, but then within that partnership, it sounds like the event is maybe not the final destination, but it's definitely something you're trying to. It's a pit stop. (laughs) What's up? It's a pit stop. Like if you're thinking of a road trip, that's an overnight stop right there. (laughs) That's true. No, that I like that. I like that illustration too, because it's, it's on the, it's on the road. It's on the journey. It's a goal. This is something I've, I've not really heard a lot of people discuss. So what, um, yeah, would you dive more into the events and and both in the the creation of them and um and kind of the benefits of them? Yeah, so the nice thing about the way I'm doing events is that it's connected to that series. So you've already primed people to want to attend that event because they've already been listening to little pieces of what you'd be talking about and then you're going to take that like a more actionable step in the event. So for myself, I have an ad. So my core content, I'll just do it based on how I do it. My core content is my podcast, Tiny Marketing. 
and I will insert an ad into each of those episodes for the event that will culminate at the end of the series. And then that event will also be advertised in my email, in my personal one-to-one signature that goes out to everyone. So they're seeing it, LinkedIn, and meetups. Meetups is huge for this. It really fills my events right up. So I use, I distribute that way. And then at the end of the series, we have the event. And most of the time I do it with a workshop. And I give them incentives to show up live. Like you get a workbook if you're showing up live. So you can actually do the work with us and have something done by the end of it. Um, Or I'll offer bonuses for attending live. But because it's easier to build that relationship and that trust when they're live and they're actually interacting with you, having conversations with you. During the event, I always tell everyone to drop their LinkedIn links in the chat so we can all connect. From there, I will connect with all of them and schedule one-on-one conversations with them. And that's how I'm able to move them from a passive listener to a customer because we've gotten a little bit more intimate during that <laughs> during that event. And then we get a little bit closer when we connect one-on-one after connecting on LinkedIn. And then if it's a good fit for you, then we might move into you being a client of mine. That's, I, I love the, the process because even as, even as you're describing it, it doesn't, it's work, but it, it's not like, it's not like organic chemistry or rocket science or no. anything just <laughs> crazy hard, but, it, but it's systematic. Yeah. And that's how I roll. Everything is super systematic. They play well together. <laughs> One feeds into the next with absolutely everything I do. The core content is like the heart of it and everything else feeds from it. Wow. So then on these workshops, as you come to the, the workshop, the event, so you, even as you are working with people ahead of time to, to schedule and to bring them in and to partner with them, you're letting them know, Hey, here's the ultimate goal. We are going to, like for your podcast, we're going to have this conversation. We'll do the interview. And then I'm going to ask you and two or three other people. We're all going to get together. We're going to do this. So it sounds like even even with the partnerships, you're getting buy-in or buy-in's wrong. Um, You're kind of setting some expectations, but showing them incredible benefits for your partners as well, because they get to leverage everybody else in the group. Uh, to promote their businesses. Yeah, exactly. So when you join my podcast, you're also getting access to all of the people, like you're being invited to the event and to be showcased as a speaker in something. I might invite you to be a speaker at a summit later, but it's a partnership where I'm constantly trying to just prop you up and make you seen by the right people. You're not trying to persuade anybody. You're not trying to sell anybody. You're just simply promoting them and you get this, this delightful relationship and reciprocity and, and everybody wins. Yeah. Yeah. I guess the more we talk through it, the more everything is relationship led. Absolutely. Every piece of this is a systematic way of building stronger relationships with people. I appreciate that. And sometimes I think we forget that, like in this whole process, you know, people, you know, you hear the phrase people buy from other people and, but it, it really is people. You're not trying to, yeah, trying to sell. You're just trying to serve. Yes. And for service providers, it's a pretty intimate relationship. You're working closely with another person. You need to vibe with them. And this whole process will give you all the opportunities in the world to attract and repel the right people. That's an interesting phrase you just use. Gives you opportunities to attract and repel the right people. Would you elaborate on that? Because I think there are a lot of people, maybe not a lot, but at least there will be some people who are like, I don't, I don't want to repel anybody. What would you go into that a little? 
Yeah. If you don't repel people, then you're not being yourself. You're not being an authentic version of you to the public. And then when you start that relationship and they become a client, it's going to be so much friction. You are not the right person for everybody. I am definitely not the right person for everybody. So you want to be absolutely 100% yourself in all of these pieces. So you are getting really great fit clients in that you enjoy working with. You, you want a business you love. Is that something with the founders that you work with, do they, do they understand that or is that also an education piece that you kind of have to help them with? I think they understand it on a foundational level, but it's really hard to say no to money. So I, I do have to educate and remind them, you built this business because you wanted to control how your time is spent and who you spend your time with. So why on earth <laughs> wouldn't you want to repel those red flag people early on so they don't even come to you and ask for a sales call? Yeah, I've that's a hard conversation to have. I I know I've had I've talked with a lot of different especially in in the corporate world with enterprise level businesses, you're just like we can't do that, Ugh, right? That's, that's we why I don't can't like corporate. <laughs> It's so like, I can't, yeah, we can't serve that person. We can't like that, that customization, like that's not going to help us. And then we have to market it anyway. Uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have been there. I worked in Corvo for a long time and it just, I mean, I was there in my cubicle listening to all the problems we were having because we didn't repel anyone and we wanted to be bland. So we didn't say so we didn't turn anyone off. You don't stand out either. <laughs> you just blend in with everybody else. <laughs> let's let's talk a little bit about that that idea of bland and blending in because I think the as I look around the marketplace and and as I just interact with people, it's like everybody. Okay, everybody's a, too big of a, a broad of a generalization. It's this idea of. We think we're special, but we say the same thing as everybody else. How do you, within your content strategy, how do you help founders understand they have to have a, a specific voice? They have to take a, a position. They have to attract and repel. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. That is part of the content strategy is what is your unique take? What is your differentiator in your content? And make sure that that bleeds through in everything that you create. You want to make sure that you're not blending in. And that thing that makes your business special and your perspective special that makes people want to work with you, everyone needs to know it. So even if it's just a little LinkedIn post, you want that in there. And I've been drinking my own Kool-Aid doing that the entire time I've had my business and it hasn't, I have attracted the right people because I am very much myself in my content and people know what they're getting when they get on a call with me. And that makes it a lot easier. It doesn't feel like work. You know, when it feels like you're running up a hill <laughs> Kate Bush style and you're, it's just heavy and feels like so much friction. That's what happens when you're not like real and yourself and comfortable in that, in your content, you're getting those wrong fit people constantly and you're running up the hill the entire time you're working with them. So I like how you described your unique voice you know, who you are just, you know, individually as a company. I think sometimes when, when people hear that, they're like, well, you know, I don't know if their mind automatically travels like I need to be edgy or I need to be, you know, something maybe that they're not. What if they're just, you know, because some people are like, I'm, I'm just me. Like, how do I make me 
interesting or how do I make me stand out? I don't know. So the first thing I do with any of my clients is I interview them and their stakeholders. And when I walk away from that, I'm able to hear what makes you different in those conversations and how you're interacting with the other stakeholders within your company. And I identify what makes you different because it's really hard to see what makes you different when it's you. <laughs> I'm so glad you you mentioned that because yeah, it's like you can you're so into the weeds of it, just you know, from your own business, from your own person. Yeah, it can be really hard to figure out what makes you different and and stands out. I like how you I say take the burden off of them, but you're just like, hey, we'll figure it out. You don't have to do this on your own. Yeah. If, I mean, even I write all the time, but writing for myself and my own business or about me is a lot harder than writing for someone else because I can see them more clearly. I'm in the muck when it's <laughs> when I'm talking about myself. I'm living that life, but I can see clearly. I can see you clearly. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think the hardest the hardest marketing to do for anybody is is writing my own stuff yeah. and, and trying to tell my own story because it's like I, I don't know what to to say and or I just I'm too close. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate how you you help them with that. I'm sure it has to be a little bit of a relief to them as well. Yeah, most of the people I'm working with aren't marketers, so they don't even know what they should be thinking about in terms of how to write content, how to position themselves, how to like what pillars would make sense, what objections their clients are getting because they're just living in it. They're not realizing that those are all things that we can capture and fix before the objections happen. Excellent point. I, I appreciate that distinction as well. Just that that idea they're not marketers. They it's just not how they think, right? They're just they're they're in the product, they're in the customers, but they aren't thinking about things like positioning, like how do you show yourself as an expert? How do you, you know, highlight what you do well and get out of the features and get out of the functionality and just tell a story. Yeah, it's all about storytelling. People just want to hear what their life will be like afterwards. And they need you to speak up on the pain and the challenges that they're dealing with now so they can even understand that you're the person that they're talking to. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's that's I th I think that's brilliant. Just giving them the the happily ever after picture and then and then just working working towards that. Uh, you, as you've talked about the system, systemization, you've talked about the strategy and the content, and you've talked about kind of walking, having these businesses sort of walk through this process of bringing people closer in relationship and how, and, and you mentioned earlier this idea of adding them to email, mm -hmm. how, how important is like an email or getting them in your email sequence? Um, yeah. And, and how do businesses make that part of the strategy? Because that sometimes it feels like an afterthought or sometimes it, it feels like a massive spam, uh, spam journey. I, I'd love to hear where email falls into this. Yeah. I love, I love anything that you're owning. And email is your email list is something you own. So while the majority of my relationship building happens in like the DMs on LinkedIn, I'm trying to capture emails whenever I can because that will keep them in my world. And so I have a weekly newsletter that goes out and I make it really engaging where they're encouraged to reply and it's more of a conversation. I want them to feel like a friend is is emailing them and telling them like, hey, you got to try this, <laughs> that kind of thing. So I try to make it very valuable. And then as far as like selling an email, I 
don't think it works super well with service businesses, but what I do think is important is evergreen sales emails. So like once a month dripping out that email. So one, they remember what it is that you do for them and how you serve them. And you're touching on the objections that they're thinking about. So the email body would be about the objection and overcoming that and then remind them what it is that you do and how they can work with you. So once a month, drip that out. So you are making it valuable and helping them understand their problem a little bit better with each one, but it's not a hard sell because with service, it's really about relationships, but you also need to remind them how you serve. Now, and that, I like that, that idea of relationship. You do have to, you have to remind them of what you do um, just because they forget like your audience forgets or they just don't even know how you do it. Like they just know you as a, as a source of information, mm-hmm. but like, you know, you actually do stuff. Like, yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. I have a lot of listeners on the tiny marketing pod. And then I decided to make an ad. I'm like, and the ad is basically like, you know, I don't just talk about marketing. I actually do it. So if you want to work with me, <laughs> And just explaining what I do because it occurred to me, I bet these listeners just think I'm a content creator and I'm not a service provider. That is, I agree because I think sometimes both as a customer and as a, as a business under content creator, it's, you know, I think of listening to podcasts and other things and I would not necessarily reach out directly to this person and say, Hey, can you help me? And yet at the same time, as a business owner, content creator, I assume that people will just do that. And so like, I have this, I'm so disconnected. Explicit, explicit. This is what I do. Here's how you can work with me. (laughs) It's, it's a, it's a, yeah, I, in my own head, I, I get that wrong. And I have to believe like, maybe not if. Maybe not if the founders just have a strong sales background, but I'm sure if they're more product service background, that's something to also educate them on in this process because I'm guessing they're like, yeah, I mean, people will know what we do. Come on. just Yeah. And sometimes they'll have a show and it'll be like the name of the show and then brought to you by and then their product and assume that people know what that product is, who it's for. (laughs) <laughs> what problem it solves and they don't. So you have to have like a little mini commercial in there so people can understand it. Yeah, I, I, I'm learning that it's one of those, it, again, it's, I can, when I've worked for companies and, and work with them, it's like, yeah, you need to, you need to be a specific brand. You're not Nike. So you can't like, people don't know what you do. Yeah. Um, Constantly and- remind people. <laughs> And it's, it's painful too. I think, it, you know, just the idea, painful in the sense of it feels like overkill. Yeah, but it's not because we're creating our content. So it feels like, oh, everybody's seeing me say this thing a thousand times, but they're seeing like 1% of your content. So this is what I do. I have, so LinkedIn is my core channel. Um, Every post that I have, I have a signature at the end of it that explains what I do, who I do it for, and how I do it. And at the end of my email signature, same thing. (laughs) So, And then I have the evergreen sequence that reminds them what I do and, you know, whatever transformation that they're looking for, I might explain it. So there's always this reminder that's like, hey. (laughs) <laughs> here's the thing that I do and nobody minds. And it is more of like a PS line. I, I think that's, that's, that's it. It's like, nobody minds. It's just, it's out there so that if people are interested, they can find out more. Um, because yeah, it's as, as, as a founder, I'm sure with the startups, they are, there's a lot of assumptions being made. I say that as someone who makes assumptions. So I have to, I'm, I'm going to 
be daring and assume other people make assumptions too. Uh, <laughs> I so. think you're valid in that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but then even there, this, Oh, now I remember the question. Cause as we were, as you we were sharing that answer, how, once you find the right area for the content, like that one content platform that you're going for, how do you, do you ever run into people who are struggling with like imposter syndrome or how do you help them sort of get past that hump or maybe not even get past it, but just learn how to live in the uncomfortable? Yeah, constantly, constantly. I'm working with a client right now that I, right now I'm building out her LinkedIn playbook and doing a LinkedIn makeover for her. But I am trying to convince her to launch a podcast because I think that her expertise is brilliant and it's unique. And it would, like the pushback that she's getting a lot is all, every single thing that she listed, it was all about trust. It was like, we don't believe that you can do the thing that you can do. But having that core channel gives you a thousand ways to prove ahead of time that yes, I do know what I'm doing <laughs> and I, I'm still pushing her. <laughs> it, it, it's a hard thing. Like as, as somebody who has personally wrestled with it, still wrestle with it. It's, it is, it's the idea of putting yourself out there and wondering, am I good enough? Am I smart enough? Is what I'm doing? Will it be received? Well, and then it's, but then at the same time, it's this mental position, honestly, mental positioning of understanding, like, there's just a small, small percentage of people who are going to see what you do. And, and, and if you do something, if you have a typo, it ain't going to matter. No, actually, I am 1000% for leaving in those typos, leaving in those stumbling over words. People love people. In this world of AI where there's so much polish on everything, people are more attracted to that authentic, real, raw, gritty content that you're coming up with. And nobody has the experience that you have. You're the only one in the world who has the exact same experience as you and perspective as you. And people need to learn it. You know you can drive value. That's why you started a business. It's just, why are you holding back? You're gatekeeping if you don't have that core content. <laughs> it's true. And it's, but it's a hard, it's a hard thing to break. But once you do, it gets easier. I, I don't want to say easy. I, maybe for some people it's easy, but it definitely gets easier. So I'm sure you have some wonderful breakthrough moments with these people. Yeah. Yeah. And I've been there too. I mean, I wasn't a content creator from birth. I started <laughs> I started a live stream show um, during COVID. And that was the beginning of it. And yeah, I had tech hiccups. I had lighting, ugh, lighting mistakes. I sounded like I was recording in a tin can. If you listen to my early content, you will laugh. And if you're ever feeling that imposter syndrome, listen to your favorite content creators, early content, because they sounded bad too. <laughs> Everybody starts somewhere and it's just about getting your reps in, practicing, keep going and the relationships that you build along the way will give you the benefit, even if nobody shows up for your live stream show. Yeah. The relationships and, and the repetitions both, because it it's a it's a process. It is definitely a process throughout all of it. One, as we kind of wrap up here, one takeaway that you would like to leave the audience with. Okay, one takeaway would be to identify. Can be two if you need it. It's totally cool. We're flexible. <laughs> um. Okay. I think that the easiest way to succeed in your business is to identify who that dream client is and start speaking directly to them, create everything for them. 
So identifying who that is early on will make everything else a lot easier. So let me ask, since I know that was your final point, but let me just ask one question kind of on that because it's, I think some, some listeners will be like, what happens if I'm wrong? You might be. Let's talk about that. (laughs) Yeah, please. I have reiterated who my dream client is a million times, but I was able to get work with each of those dream clients in that season of business. So test it out. And early on, your dream client could be a more broader version, like maybe the companies that you've worked with before, you know, you can help them. So you can identify a profile for them. And that could be your dream client. And then you could just get a little bit more narrow as you start working with them and realizing, well, this size department needs me the most. That's where I can give the most value. So I'm going to narrow it a little bit more to department size or revenue size, or when they grow past this size, they don't really need me. So why am I working with them? (laughs) So you can start with a profile and then narrow and narrow. I like that. I like that. You have permission to change it over time as you learn. Yeah. And as your offer shifts, you might grow your business to a place where you need your offer to be more scalable. And then your dream client might change with that to to fit that piece. And that's okay. I mean, I change all the time. Change is the only constant we have. (laughs) It is. It is. And I think that's that's where some people get hung up as well. Just this idea of, oh, what if I'm wrong? You know, what if I what if I pick wrong? And it's like, well, you just adjust. I call marketing <laughs> an experiment. I say, let's get in the lab, test out your hypothesis on who your dream client would be, and then reiterate. Everything is fixable. You just have to come up with that hypothesis and <laughs> test it. It is. It is. But it you you can't find it out until you get in the lab, mm-hmm. until you get it out there. Sarah, this has been this has been a wonderful uh, conversation. If people want to know more about you, uh, more about what you do, more about your own content, where would you like them to go? Yes. So you can listen to the podcast, Tiny Marketing, and go to my website, Sarah Noel Block, my name, dot com slash, we'll do fault, slash fault, F-A-U-L-T. And that will take you to all the links that you'd need. Excellent. So Tiny Marketing Podcast, uh, sarahnoelblock.com slash fault for all the links. Uh, If you're listening, we're going to drop all that in the show notes so you can definitely learn and start listening and get into the content and just just continue growing your business. Sarah, this has been a a wonderful conversation. I, I truly appreciate you joining me today. Thanks for having me.